This week on Lewis on the Law, I've got another great show for you. I have attorney Joel Vanderveer in the studio with me, and we're going to talk residential real estate transactions. Welcome to Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I have yet another awesome show for you guys today. In the spirit of empowering you, the listener, many of you guys are going to buy houses. And so I have attorney Joel Vanderveer on with me, and we're going to break down some of the the, uh, lingo, some of the paperwork, some of the issues you'll face in a residential real estate transaction. How Joel, how's how's it going, man? Oh, it's great. Great. Oh, no. Thank you for having me on. Me and Joel go back a little bit, so we used to work together. So um, it's good to have you on. It's good to have you in, on the air with me. Yeah, it's happy good. to be here. Uh-huh. I do want to say I do uh, listen to your show when I can, and uh, I, I like what you're doing. So okay. I wish you all the best. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Um, okay, so um, uh, Joel Vanderveer is a managing partner at or is a managing partner at Vanderveer and Page, and um, you guys specialize in residential transactions, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay, cool. So how's business these days? Well, I mean, this is actually, uh, I, I guess if I could have come in at, at the right time, this would be it. Uh, okay. uh, people are hearing the interest rates are, are really, really uh, low right now. Uh, so people are refinancing, buying homes. Uh, so this was the best time for me to actually get in without actually knowing it. So <laughs> Wow, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, business is booming. I know uh, the uh, real estate lawsuit business is doing well oh, yeah. right now. Yeah. I'm caught up in it, and, uh, and uh, I keep getting calls. So it's good stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about the residential real estate transaction process. Um, so, so, you know, say I'm going to buy a house, you know, what kind of things do I really need to? What kind of things are at issue here when you're buying a house? I know the title of the house is is, is something. Do the do the attorneys handle that? Uh, yeah. So I mean, that, it's a, a quite an extensive transaction, uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of hands involved. Uh, the attorneys actually really come in at the end. Um, mm-hmm. For most home buyers, uh, the first thing they're going to do is either talk to a lender uh, to mm-hmm. see what they could afford, mm-hmm. and then contact an agent. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's the practice. Yeah. Uh, you know, then they identify where they want to buy. Uh, and then from there, uh, they they put in an offer. The agent helps them get through the contract. Uh, in Georgia, it is uh, not um, typical for them to hire an attorney. Some states do. Uh, so in Georgia, most uh, parties are not represented by counsel. Uh, mm-hmm. The uh, agents assist them with the drafting of that contract. The attorneys step in after the contract's already signed and executed. Amendments and whatnot are actually put in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that gets then conveyed uh, to the attorney's office to then uh, process the closing transaction. Nice, nice. So, um, so there's always an attorney involved in a real, a real estate transaction Correct. here in Georgia, Correct. and I, I know the buyer often has the option to select an attorney. So, doesn't the attorney represent the buyer in that instance? Well, that's actually a great question, uh, and and it's it's kind of a I, I wouldn't say a misnomer, but I don't say it's 100 percent accurate. Now, mm-hmm. the the Georgia Association of Realtors contracts actually do write in that it is of the buyer's uh, choice. However, mm-hmm. everything is contractual and negotiable, right? So if the seller decides, you know what, uh, I'm actually paying some seller pay closing costs here mm-hmm. to the tune of, you know, let's say $2,000. Uh, it's not abnormal to see uh, some good percentage on there. Uh, they have every right to say, you know what, I want to close with my attorney. Mm-hmm. Um, but the question you're actually getting to is mm-hmm. representation at the table. If there is uh, a, a conventional lender involved mm-hmm. uh, or even a, you know, just say a private lender, typically the attorney is going to represent the lender in the transaction. And I think that's really important because I because in real estate litigation litigation I get this all the time. Well, didn't the attorney represent me? All right. And and, uh, and so I have to I have to break the news to them that no, the attorney represents the lender. Right. And uh-huh. I'll tell you at every closing, every attorney they're going to have a document that the buyer mm-hmm. signs and seller signs acknowledging that they are not uh, representing them in any official capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And even in my signature block on my emails, it says unless we have signed an agreement otherwise. I'm not representing you. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think that is that is where there a lot of confusion comes in, especially for first time home buyers who've never gone through the process before, and then they get into some kind of discrepancy later on. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that and that does uh, give us issues as a, as closing attorneys mm-hmm. because oftentimes uh, buyers will ask some questions, uh, mm-hmm. and even sellers will ask questions to the attorney uh, closing the transaction. And we have to be careful uh, mm-hmm. what we say uh, mm-hmm. for fear that we may be. Uh, providing uh, counsel and advice that they would be relying on. And if that is the case, they certainly could have a cause of action if we give them bad advice. 
a nice, and that's something that I have to do on this show constantly is I have to throw out these legal disclaimers because oh, I, yeah. I can't I can't let people think that I'm giving them legal advice <laughs> over the air. Right. We can only give out legal information. And there goes my disclaimer. <laughs> We're only giving out legal information. This is not legal advice. Okay, so you hear about a lot of different uh, different facets of a clo- of closing paperwork and closings. So first, I want to get into the title. What is what what's involved with the title? The title opinion. You hear that kind of thing. Sure. Title research. What what's involved? With right. That? Well, when you're a, a buyer looking to buy a house, mm-hmm. uh, I think probably the most fundamental thing you're going to want to know is that the seller actually owns that property. Right. <laughs> so you uh, you uh, you know that's surprising, yeah. but it actually <laughs> happens. Comes up in real estate litigation yeah. where people buy from a person who doesn't actually yeah, own right. the property. And, and, and you're exactly right, uh-huh. and you're seeing scams. Uh, you know, through various means, mediums, mm-hmm. uh, social media, even there's scams mm-hmm. on selling property, leasing property. Uh, so the fundamental, I would say, uh, aspect of a title opinion. Uh, would be uh, conveying uh, who's conveying title is the mm-hmm. seller actually own this property mm-hmm. and you get into the minutia and, 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 the, and the legal kind of minutia of that title opinion uh, mm-hmm. goes into things like are there any liens or judgments mm-hmm. that need to be taken care of so as a closing attorney when I receive a contract uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, hire an examiner I don't go mm-hmm. to the courthouse myself mm-hmm. <laughs> I can go everywhere in Georgia mm-hmm. uh, but there are uh, skilled and professional people at all the uh, counties uh, in the state mm-hmm. uh, that you uh, can hire and they will actually do the title research uh, look at the docket and just see uh, what the chain of title is any liens open liens or judgments taxes have they been paid mm-hmm. um, and and then they provide what's called that title abstract or mm-hmm. examination and it goes by various terms uh, mm-hmm. to the attorney myself Uh, And then from there, uh, we are agents of a title insurance company, typically. Mm -hmm. Uh, Although there are different practices in Georgia that I've uh, become recently aware of, uh, sometimes the actual uh, issuer of the ti- of the title insurance is not the closing attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get out of state uh, title companies that receive deals that mm-hmm. uh, work nationwide, uh, and they will be the ones to issue title. So if you see that closing disclosure, and we'll get to that, I'm sure, mm-hmm. uh, with the list of fees, it would not be surprising to see the closing attorney, a title company, title mm-hmm. insurance company, so various names on there. Yeah. So um, that brings me into another aspect of this title insurance. Does everybody need that? I mean, uh, well, I mean, asking me as an attorney, yes, yeah, <laughs> but okay. it's not required. Uh, okay. Well, if, if you're getting a loan, mm-hmm. uh, the a conventional lender, mm-hmm. yes, they are going to require title insurance. You're gonna, as the buyer, you're going to have to pay for that. Mm-hmm. Now, the, I think, well, what what does title insurance do? I mean, it's, it sounds right. fancy if they've already done a title title search, giving you a title opinion. Sure. What's the good of title title insurance? Uh, well, I think ultimately it's to to protect the parties involved that that title examination was done correctly. For one, <laughs> nice. that the examiner did not miss anything. Like uh-huh. for example, uh, at, at in Fulton County, for example, there was a stretch of time when the deed records were burnt. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, there is a gap uh, in chains uh, of titles out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people don't know that, but it, it's just one of those small things that, you know, can present an issue later down the line. And uh, yes, you, you get you get attorneys involved, right? We're going to do our due diligence. We're going to mm-hmm. make sure everything's caught. But people make mistakes. If the examiner missed something and it's not on my abstract, my title exam, mm-hmm. uh, then I'm not going to catch it. Or, you know, if I miss something, uh, mm-hmm. it's you're putting the entire purchase of that property uh, on the line. Uh, and the insurance policy is meant to, to say, you know what, you're going to be protected should something have happened. And it does happen. And it does it happen? It does happen. Okay, yeah. Well, Not I, very I, often, well, which is why the rate of payout from the insurance companies is pretty low if yeah. you were to ask them. But yeah. It does happen. Yeah, right. Okay, so we've talked about t- uh, title insurance. Are there are there steps that um, that a first-time home buyer has to take in making sure that, you know, this transaction is safe? Uh, it's safe in the sense of... Um, like I would no in I the mean, sense that that from a title insurance perspective, mm-hmm. you're, you're I mean, kind of putting I kind of want to get to a question of okay. a listener that a listener sent me this really long, complicated question. Sure. That I'm going to have to actually, you know what? We're getting a little bit close to the end of this segment, and, and I, I want to I want to give this question due because because it caused a, it caused a huge problem and it deals with due diligence. Mm-hmm. But uh, before we get to the, so we're going to cut this segment just a couple of seconds short. Before we get to the end of the segment, Joel, will you give them some contact information for uh, Yeah, sure. Again, my, my mm-hmm. firm is Vanderveer and Page. Uh, the website is vpattorneysatlaw.com. Uh, phone number is 470-509-3883. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis. If you have an idea for this show, you can always contact me on my webpage at jameslewislegal.com. You can go to the last page and go to my contact page and just drop me a message. 
like uh, Duped here did, and tell me uh, what kind of issue you'd like to hear spoken about on my show, and I'll bring an attorney on, and we'll talk about it. You can always contact me at james at jameslewislegal.com, or you can give me a phone call at 404-610-0075. Once again, this show is not meant to replace the advice of an attorney. If you have a serious legal issue, um, you need to go ahead and hire an attorney. This show is only meant to bring you legal information. It might help you take your first step in a legal process to may help you decide if you have an issue, what type of things need to be preserved, what type of attorney you're looking for. When we get back, we're going to get to one of our listeners' call, uh, questions. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I want to let you know that this show is not does not only air on Saturday afternoons here in the Atlanta area, but it streams nationally on Google Play, iTunes, Apple Play. I was given a list last week to read, and I have totally and I have totally forgotten it. Spotify. I should know Spotify. Spotify is one of my main one of my yeah. main go tos. So. I should know that. And we are also AI compatible. You can go to your AI device. You can go to Google Play or Alexa and say, hey, Alexa, play Lewis on the Law, episode 58 with attorney Joel Vanderveer. And voila, this show will come streaming out of your AI listening device. How about that for modern technology? <laughs> yeah, that, that's all due to our, our dude, Sam, over here, our, our, our all-star <laughs> producer. He's got it going on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I have attorney Joel Vanderveer on with me. We've got an awesome show going, and this one really empowers you, the listener, because we're talking about something that most of you guys will do, or at least a large percentage of you might do one day, and that's buy your own property, partake in a residential real estate transaction. So, Joel, I want to start this off with a, with a, a question from a listener. Sure. And uh, Duped, I love you. You're a great guy. Thanks for this question. I'm sorry that you got in this predicament, and sorry I couldn't have been more help, but maybe Joel might shed some insight. I have a duped says I have a house that is on a septic tank. He's a contractor. So I did not. So he did not get a home inspection at the time. And, and this is kind of what I was getting to, to that due diligence question I was asking earlier, but he didn't get a home inspection. And I was informed that the house was on the sewage city sewage system. When he moved in, he found that the house was on a septic tank. And that, of course, you know, that, and his septic tank required a ton of work. It was leaking. There were smells, all kinds of issues that, that you don't want to have to do do when you're trying to enjoy your new or new to you home. Um, did the seller have a duty to disclose the septic tank system, and did his real estate ha agent have a duty to disclose it if they knew about it? Okay, so Signed, that, duped. If they knew about it, I guess that's good. that's mm. primary. Yes. Yeah, so mm. if his agent knew about the septic tank, so I, I'm going to take a step back here. Mm. Um, did you say that he was informed that it was not on that it was on the, the city? The the, uh, the seller and the seller's agent represented okay. that it was on the city sewage system. He is not sure whether his agent knew about it or not. All right, I'd say going after his own agent. Uh, they're not experts mm -hmm. uh, in these matters, and if you look at the Georgia Association of Realtors, they call it short, GAR for short. Mm -hmm. Contracts, they, they pretty much uh, disclaim liability for things like that because mm -hmm. uh, they're not experts. They don't claim to be. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess from the sellers, did they disclose it on the uh, property disclosure statement? That's that's one of the uh, really important documents that everybody buying a property uh, should get and receive mm -hmm. from the seller, unless it was, was bought as is. Do mm -hmm. we know that? Um, I think the property was bought as is, but I okay. don't actually know because I didn't know to ask that question. Yes. And, and the document's called a property disclosure yes. statement? Yes. Okay, that's excellent. It's, I didn't even it's have super that in important. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, unless the property is bought as is. If the property is bought as is, and mm -hmm. that pretty much takes this out of the realm of a contractual uh, uh, representation, mm -hmm. uh, and it gets into the more of a claim of fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, and a claim of fraud is extremely difficult uh, because if you don't have the contract to, to uh, something in writing to base this on, mm -hmm. and it's a, a verbal uh, disclosure by the seller, or the seller's agent. You're I'm pretty sure there was no property disclosure statement, yeah. but I want okay. to get back into that because that's interesting. All right, yeah. yeah so go, going down that path, then uh, the claim of fraud does lean heavily onto what the seller knew or should have known. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if it's on a septic, they should know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the buyer, and you mentioned this uh, in the intro to this question, uh, has a duty of due diligence. Mm -hmm. So there are there's a lot of questions in here. Is this an area where the neighbors are on septic tanks? Um, mm -hmm. 
if they are, I mean, one could easily argue, well, you should know that there's septic tanks mm-hmm. throughout this neighborhood. It's not none of nobody's connected to city. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- these would be the the fault that his argument would be presented with. Um, in trying to claim fraud that the seller misrepresented and failed to disclose, mm-hmm. uh, or in this case, actually misrepresented the uh, the negative that there was uh, that it was on city. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say he's going to have a very tough tough time if this property was sold as is, which which it sounds like it was, uh, mm-hmm. to actually get fraud on this. But uh, the agent, certainly the listing agent, the seller's agent, uh, there's some liability there if they knew or should have known that there was septic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it, so, so it's not like there's no case, no case here. Mm-hmm. It just seems like a very hard one. It's a difficult one. Yes, I mean, uh, duped. Poor duped. I actually spoke with him on the phone, and he was upset at everyone, including the attorney. He's and he said, "I picked oh. the attorney. Doesn't the attorney represent me?" And I had to break <laughs> break the news to him that uh, well, even the attorney the, probably yeah, didn't yeah. know. I mean, I know. Right, right. Well, I mean, uh, that's one thing you do when you're buying a property, especially mm-hmm. if you're an investor. A lot of investors. Uh, do pursue properties and uh, sometimes distress properties and buy them as is. Well, when you buy property as is, you're getting no uh, disclosure from the seller of mm-hmm. of the quality, uh, any uh, uh, defects, hidden defects. Sellers like I'm not at duty at all to disclose these things to you because the property is as is. So mm-hmm. the uh, the buyer does take a, a a big risk there. But the counter to that is they're getting typically a good deal on it. So. Um, you just have to weigh the pros and cons. Sometimes sellers, especially if it's a distressed property, uh, maybe they're underwater um, and they don't want to have anything to, 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 to make repairs. You know what? They, they'll they be willing to take a hit mm-hmm. on the sale price uh, to not have to uh, uh, to disclose and make those kind of repairs. So um, you can find good properties, good deals that way, but you also can encounter a risk such as this one. Yeah. And it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty pricey risk for him. OK, yeah. so property disclosure statement. Uh, what exactly t- what type of uh, things have to be disclosed on the property disclosure statement? Well, it's um, it, it, it's a standard GAR form mm-hmm. uh, that asks things like fixtures, uh, mm-hmm. what fixtures will stay at the property, things like a second fridge. Uh, you have a refrigerator staying with the property. Well, what about the refrigerator in the garage? Well, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it goes to things like that window blinds. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, typically in, in in contractual law, fixtures stay with the property. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are nuances. Sometimes things like a second fridge, things that can be unplugged and removed pretty easily, um, that can call into a question whether, whether they will stay or not with the property. Um, so that's one one section of the property disclosure statement. Another section um, really does go into: Are there any material defects uh, which the seller is um, is required to disclose to a mm-hmm. buyer um, that should be made they that the buyer should be made aware of? Um, are there any active leaks or prior uh, you know uh, plumbing leaks on the property that were fixed? Uh, gives the opportunity of the seller not only to disclose that but to explain what had happened. Um, mm-hmm. Or if and there's a septic tank on the property that's on there, uh, when was the last time it was maintained? Was it has it been maintained regularly? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is opportunity again for the seller to, as they're required to, to disclose these things. Uh, another question too that comes up often is the inspections. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes people think, oh, well, my ins- I hired an inspector, shouldn't they have discovered all of these things? Well, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's kind of a, a complex answer, but uh, long and short of it, most inspectors actually are only liable to the fee that they uh, uh, charge. Mm-hmm. So it's it's oftentimes part of that in, in document the inspector has you sign that they're only liable up to what the, uh, to what their fee is, and and two, they're only. Uh, able to see to 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 inspect things that are visibly uh, seen. Mm. They can't if it's break concealed, into walls, right? Uh-huh. If it's concealed, if there's mold, radon, mm. a, a septic tank, mm. most time, many times you can, you don't so, know. So even with a home inspection, he would, he, he might not have uh, picked right. up on the septic tank. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, he's kicking himself, and you know, I don't know how to advise him on this. I'm like, he should, probably should have gotten a home inspection. But you're pointing out that even if he had gotten a home inspection, he might have still not picked up on this. Right, which is why that that property disclosure is very important mm-hmm. because it basically you can't just leave it blank as a seller. If there's a septic tank and you leave it blank, uh, you're basically you have to disclose that. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, it, it, that's why that document is important because what it does is it makes it part of the body of the contract. And so now it goes a little bit out of the realm of a fraud case, a claim of fraud, mm-hmm. and it goes into more a breach of contract case, which is much more, which is much easier mm-hmm. uh, for the buyer uh, to win. In court. Yeah. Yeah. Breach of contracts. Those exactly. come up quite often. Right. Yes. Okay. That was awesome. Love that. Love, love that little commentary. Love <laughs> the disclosures on that. Duped. I feel sorry for you. You kind of, yeah, sorry, I, dude. <laughs> you, you listen a lot. I know I get a lot of uh, calls from you. So, um, hope that helped a little bit. Um, now, let's take a look at the Okay, so these days in closing packages, people get these huge stacks. I mean, sometimes they're like 100 pages oh, of yeah. just a whole bunch of stuff. So I kind of want to go through a little bit of what a buyer will actually see in these closing packages. 
So, you know, first things first, you, a lot of times you'll see like an Alta settlement statement and you'll see something called a closing disclosure. And they look very similar and, and they have some similarities. First, let's get into the Alta settlement statement. What exactly is that? Uh, sure. So uh, the Alta is, uh, stands for American Land Title Association. It's kind of the national arm of uh, of, of uh, uh, title insurance uh, standards, closing standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so you may hear Alta practices, Alta standards. That's kind of what that, that refers to. Uh, that goes to the seller in a transaction. So uh, it, it looks more, if people have done a closing, say, five years ago, they may be familiar with the HUD-1 statement. Mm -hmm. It looks as close to that as we have now. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why that only goes to the seller is because the buyer gets that closing disclosure mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in where there's a conventional lender involved. If it's mm -hmm. just a cash transaction, uh, it's a little different. We can use the settlement statement for both parties, but mm -hmm. uh, most transactions we're getting, you know, has have a loan, a lender involved, conventional lender. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 closing disclosure uh, for the buyer goes uh, gives you loan terms, interest rate, uh, monthly payment breakdown, things that the government decided, uh, you know, a few years ago. You know what? The seller doesn't need to see all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they decided we'll go ahead and have a separate disclosure and, and signature side for the buyer. And the Alta settlement statement, which pretty much just breaks down the closing uh, uh, price, the, the mm -hmm. sales price of the property, any fees that listing agents have, any seller pay closing costs, basically just a much easier, in my opinion, and it's only a two-page document versus mm -hmm. a closing disclosure was five pages. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that, that that's what the seller would get, a little bit more abbreviated version. That was awesome. So, you know, we've actually already run out of time. This show is going by really fast. Lots of great information for you, the listeners out there. Joel, we give them some contact information for you once again. Oh, of course. Yes, my, my name is Joel Vanderveer. Uh, I started my law firm, Vanderveer & Page. Website is vpattorneysatlaw.com. Uh, phone number, if you want to give us a call, is 470-509-3883. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and you can always give me a call at 404-610-0075. At you can email me at james at jameslewislegal.com, or you can go ahead and go to my website, and my last page on my website is a contact page, and you can just drop me a line. If you have a real estate dispute, you can always contact me. If you need an attorney to represent you in a real estate transaction, you, all, you can always contact my buddy Joel here, and, uh, and he'll be glad to help you out. If you have a serious legal issue, this show is not meant to give you legal advice. This show is only meant to give you legal information. If you have a serious legal issue, you need to go ahead and hire an attorney. You can always contact me. You can go to my website. All my shows are archived on my website. You can go through them. I allow each attorney that comes onto my show to give you contact information for them individually, or you can always hit me up and say, hey, that show on real estate transactions, what was that attorney's name again? And I'll be glad to help you out and point you in the right direction. When we get back, we're going to get more into this closing package that you'll see when you're sitting at your uh, closing attorney's office. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I'm your host this week and every week. I have a great show going on today, and I'm empowering you, the listeners. I have attorney Joel Vanderveer on with me, and he's the managing partner at Vanderveer & Page. And we are talking residential real estate closings right now. Now, this closing package has got a lot of stuff in it, you know, and so you'll you'll come across the security deed and the promissory note and all this stuff. I mean, is all that necessary? I guess it is because you're buying a house and you <laughs> want to be secured. But what but what's the what's the promissory note? What's the security deed? What do they do and and why are they there? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's uh, well. As far as necessary goes, if you have a loan, mm -hmm. uh, which is our most real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. If you have a cash deal, uh, we're talking five pages. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's yeah. a very quick process. Uh, uh, but if you got a loan, yes, yeah, so the, the, there's a lot of government requirements the lender has. Obviously, mm -hmm. the lender needs to secure. Um, they have the promissory note and the mm -hmm. security deed, uh, which secures the loan in the in that property. Um, so, so, so a note. I mm -hmm. so so a note. You know, I, I get. You know, it's basically the contract, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but what's why the security deed? Yeah. So yeah, as you pointed out, that promissory note is the negotiable instrument that mm -hmm. the lenders uh, they sell them. Uh, most lenders, when they close a transact, well. Can't say most. It depends. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have a broker, uh, the, a lending broker, uh, they will sell the loan. And uh, usually somebody, a bigger bigger shop that services it will buy it. And mm -hmm. basically they're buying that promissory note. Mm -hmm. The security deed uh, gives everybody notice uh, that there is a loan on this property. Mm -hmm. And that should the buyer not uh, and borrower not pay 
not uh, maintain the property, not pay their taxes, not have homeowners insurance, and a number of other uh, reasons, uh, that lender can uh, foreclose on the property. And the a security deed in Georgia allows them to do so um, and through certain rights such as acceleration. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have to give the buyer 30 days notice uh, if there is a default, mm-hmm. and the buyer should have that time basically to pay off the entire mortgage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if they can't do that, uh, then the lender can uh, can come in and, and foreclose on the property. Wow. So it's a security deed that actually allows that? That's the big, that's why that's the big one. Yeah. That document uh, usually runs about 14, 15 pages or so with some writers uh, mm-hmm. attached to it. Yeah. Writers would be like a PUD, plan unit development. So writer. wait a minute. What is, what yeah. is a writer? You used a fancy <laughs> word there. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it basically, it's a fancy way of saying an, a document attached to it. It okay. doesn't stand mm-hmm. on its own. It goes mm-hmm. along like an exhibit or so you could call it that mm-hmm. or amendment. Uh, but basically what it is, what it does is uh, it just tells you, okay, there are other things with this property. If it's a planned unit, which typically homeowners association, people mm-hmm. associate with that, they're going to have a, a PUD writer, it's called, mm-hmm. that says basically that the uh, owner now has to comply with those covenants and restrictions uh, mm-hmm. that run with the property. And that's mm-hmm. another reason why you have a title exam done is because as a buyer, you should be made aware before you buy property of any covenants and restrictions that run with the land. Well, the HOA is a big one. It can be expensive oh, yeah. too. And oh, yeah. Very restrictive. Mm-hmm. They can have daily uh, uh, fees and, yeah. you know, if, if you're in violation. So, yeah. uh, and as a buyer, you are deemed to have notice when you buy a property uh, because those should be of record, uh, yeah. recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, so you mentioned security deeds. So that's in Georgia, though. Some states don't have security deeds. They use other, other instruments like a deed of trust, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, the North Carolina is is, mm-hmm. is common with that. Oh, that's interesting. So, mm-hmm. what's the difference between a security deed and a deed of trust? Right. So, in uh, deed of trust, uh, appoints a trustee mm-hmm. uh, to hold title uh, to mm-hmm. the property, a neutral, not the lender. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may sound nuanced, but essentially, in Georgia, you actually get that warranty deed at closing that says mm-hmm. you now own the property, and that gets mm-hmm. recorded. Uh, in a in a state that uses a deed of trust, that that deed is typically held by that trustee, mm-hmm. uh, and you do not get title to the property uh, until you pay off that loan. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I did not know that I'm stuck in Georgia law. So, right. you yeah. know, and now I've seen deed of trust written, but I just thought it was a trust document. Yeah, you know, yeah. The well, and it, yeah, it kind of is. It's placed in a trust. Yeah, it's held yeah. in, in trust. That The title mm-hmm. is held in trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what that does is in those states, it allows um, them to bypass a judicial foreclosure mm-hmm. requirement uh, because the trustee has the power of sale in those mm-hmm. deed of trust typically. Uh, so they can sell the property uh, through whatever means the deed of trust uh, allows. Now, in Georgia, it's also a non-judicial foreclosure state, but we don't use a deed of trust. We use a security deed. Well, uh, I definitely want to get into the yeah. non-judicial foreclosure because that that can be a hot topic. Sure. You know, I mean, people are like, what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds scary. Uh-huh. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the escrow account because I get questions on that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so first, what is the escrow account and um, is it useful? Uh, so that just depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, most lenders, depending on the position of the buyer, how mm-hmm. much loan to value they have in the property, uh, most will require an escrow account. Mm-hmm. And a lot of buyers uh, are okay with that. And what mm-hmm. that is, is uh, at that on that closing disclosure, you will see uh, a deposit. It could mm-hmm. be substantial depending on the time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a deposit into an escrow account that the lender holds for the buyer. Uh, and what that does is you pay into that account monthly. And when your recurring bills come due for your taxes, property taxes, uh, and homeowners insurance policy, hazard insurance, uh, they will come out of that escrow account. A lot of people like that convenience because it's easy for them to just say, yeah, I take it out of my mortgage. My taxes are escrowed in. Yes, uh, yeah, mine are too. <laughs> yeah, it, it just makes it easier. I just pay one fee right. each month and I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes you get savvy buyers. That, mm-hmm. You know what? They, they want to manage the money themselves. They feel they can invest it and maybe make some interest on that money mm-hmm. uh, that they put into an account monthly. Uh, just beware if if the lender does allow you to do that, that the bill is still owed when, and the, it, comes when it comes due. due. And it's, yes, it can be big. <laughs> That's and it can be. Yeah, so yeah, depending on the on the value of the property. Yeah, certainly. exactly. So. Yeah, if you're a savvy buyer, of course, and you're good at managing your finances, that's always an option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, another thing about that, um, the property taxes, what exactly is, and I think maybe that's later, but I wanted to ask you about the homestead exemption. I actually had a show a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and it was about how to freeze your homestead exemption but or your homestead tax exemption. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, your tax exemption. So exactly what is that? Well, you're allowed in Georgia and in, in every county I'm aware of mm-hmm. to file a homestead exemption, which is mm-hmm. uh, only for your primary residence. So mm-hmm. if you're an investor, sorry, you don't qualify for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, basically you, you you get a discount. And mm-hmm. depending on the county, uh, it, it varies on how big that discount is. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, that's it, really. You just uh, you 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 notify the county of the uh, the property where the property is located, uh, and on that tax bill, uh, if, assuming you qualify for it, uh, mm-hmm. you'll get that tax exemption. There are other exemptions as well. Uh, veterans often get exemptions. Uh, elderly, if you're above like 65, I think in some counties, some I think the different counties maybe have different ages for this. Mm-hmm. And in some counties, not Fulton, unfortunately, but uh, that those exemptions could actually be quite big because. Mm-hmm. Uh, in full, uh, in those counties, you can um, not have a school uh, tax mm-hmm. uh, tied to your property if you are above a certain age. Whereas in Fulton, they even if you know you could be whatever you know you could be next to death door, and you still have you to still gotta pay school uh, taxes. Yeah, right. That's um, yeah. There's too many uh, high high valued properties in Fulton County uh, <laughs> yeah. that are all owned by uh, the elderly that they would <laughs> they they, lose give that away. They'll lose a lot of money. Yeah. So, but mm-hmm. other counties uh, they they do offer that Forsyth, uh, you know, Hall County. They do offer mm-hmm. that that exemption as well. Okay, excellent. So you, you see this uh, document, and it's called the U.S. Patriot Act form sometimes mm-hmm. in, in these closing packages. What exactly is that? Well, you know, a lot of this came out of, um, you know, what had happened, uh, you know, with with terrorist funding mm-hmm. after 9-11, especially. Mm-hmm. Was there an issue with terrorist funding from, like, uh, loans? <laughs> well, I think, well, I, I'm was sure there was, issue? but uh, I, I can't really speak to that other than, uh, we became very aware and sensitive uh, mm-hmm. to uh, funding uh, of that nature. Uh, so the U.S. Patriot Act um, required that there's a name check on everybody in a closing transaction mm-hmm. to make sure they're not on a list. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, if your name is, you know, has Muhammad, it's probably going to pop up. Uh, not uncommon to see that. It's just mm-hmm. unfortunate there's a lot with that. But. So Basically, wait a minute, if you're document, on this list, can you not get a home loan in That's America? not necessarily true. Okay. Now, what we do, I mean, it, it may just pop up, but mm-hmm. uh, we do checks, and and it does come back that uh, uh, we basically check it with a Social Security number. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. Patriot Act, uh, those document you see, uh, mm-hmm. basically just to confirm that, yes, I saw an ID, mm-hmm. and this person has a Social Security number. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. not something to be, to be scared about, mm-hmm. uh, but that is kind of an added check uh, mm-hmm. that has been put into all these closings. Yeah, someone asked me if if, uh, if actually if, if they're monitoring for terrorism this way, and I'm just like, I have no idea. The yeah. U.S. Patriot Act form? I think, you know, money uh, laundering, fraud, you know, mm-hmm. the, but the laundering <clears throat> specifically are, are certainly things that are looked at because, especially when you have international buyers, uh, mm-hmm. international sellers, there's a lot more heightened um, awareness regarding that. Yeah. Well, attorneys themselves, they can get caught up in money laundering with their escrow accounts. I mean, oh, we haven't uh, heard anything about that. Yeah, yeah. You never <laughs> hear about that. But uh, but sure enough. OK, so let's talk a little bit about some of your rights there. Um, so I actually want to talk a little bit about because we're going to have one more segment. And actually, we're close to the end of the segment. I want to get into the waiver of borrowers rights because it's a fascinating thing. The judicial foreclosure mm-hmm. and non-judicial foreclosure. I think we'll start off with that when we get back there because um, because okay. I don't think we have enough time to get into that during this segment. So, Joel, once again, why don't you give them some contact information? Sure. Again, my name is Joel Vanderveer. Law firm is Vanderveer and Page. Uh, please visit us, www.vpattorneysatlaw.com. Uh, phone numbers if you want to give us a call is 470-509-3883. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I have an awesome show going for you guys today. And this show is all about empowering you, the listener. And I know a lot of you guys are going to eventually buy your own home. So this will be a great show for you guys to refer back to. You'll hear a lot of good information here on what you're looking for when you're a home buyer, what some of the documents mean, and maybe you need to hire an attorney. Um, and Joel is right here to help you. Um, when we get back, we're going to get into some of your rights as, as a homeowner, your rights during this transaction, and how you can waive some of those rights. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I have an awesome and empowering show going for you, the listener. Um, This show is about residential real estate transactions. I have attorney Joel Vanderveer on with me, and I want to let you know that this show not only airs on Saturdays, but we stream nationally on every single major national streaming platform you can think of. Apple Music or Apple, uh, Google Play, iTunes. I, I want to call it Apple Music, but it's actually iTunes. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so square. I, I had a show the other the other week, and we ended it with uh, Tupac. And I was like, and and and, th- and we're ending the show with Tupac. And, of course, <laughs> uh, the attorney next to me was like, 
even I know yeah. that. How square are you? And I'm just like, what? Did I lose all my street Has it cred? been that long? Been that long? <laughs> it, it, I guess it has. And uh, and not only, you know, Apple, Google, Spotify, but all the hip new streaming medias, this, this show streams nationally on all of those platforms. And we are also AI compatible. You can go, hey, Alexa, play Lewis on the Law, episode 58 with attorney Joel Vanderveer. And this show will come streaming out of your AI listening device. Joel, when we last left off, I wanted to talk about the the whole judicial because you you you, you kind of touched on it a judicial foreclosure process and a non judicial foreclosure process and you even said that Georgia is a non judicial foreclosure state. What the heck are you talking about with all of that? Well, it does sound scary, doesn't it? it uh, well, there's a yeah. lot. There's a lot there. I mean, you got judicial foreclosure, non judicial foreclosure, right, right. and Georgia is a non judicial foreclosure state. Yeah. So basically, what does that mean? It, what that means is, does the lender have to sue uh, to to get the property uh, mm-hmm. through foreclosure? Uh, mm-hmm. In Georgia, they do not, um, because we have um, the, the buyer has to sign a waiver of borrower's rights. Mm-hmm. So you don't go before a judge um, when the property gets foreclosed, foreclosed on. You have to be given notice, uh, the right to accelerate, what I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and once the notice is conveyed to you, the the owner of the property, and you cannot pay off that mortgage within those 30 days, mm. uh, then a notice goes out uh, to in the in the paper, uh, there's online sources as well, mm-hmm. uh, that the property is going to be foreclosed on. Mm. And then that does happen for a month as well. And then after that, um, the property can go up for auction at the courthouse steps. You literally will have people, attorneys typically, standing on the courthouse steps, crying the sale of a foreclosure property here. Yes. <laughs> that, that is, that does is happen. awesome. And my I wife mean, actually I, used to do that. It's so. not It's not awesome. Does your wife still do that? She does not. She's at home with the kids. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Too bad because I would, I would love to do a show just on foreclosures. Oh, it seems yeah. like there's a lot to it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so okay, so you went to the – so what is the difference between the – I guess it's quicker to do a, a non-judicial is. foreclosure? Yeah, less expensive, quicker, mm-hmm. uh, and certainly that, the lenders like that. Um, and not every state is like that. Um, I don't know the numbers, but – Florida is you. You do have to go in before a judge mm-hmm. uh, uh, to be foreclosed on, but mm-hmm. not in Georgia. Now, in a judicial foreclosure, is it is the property still sold at a courthouse steps at the end of the whole process? Yes. Uh, so well, yeah, well, so assuming there's a, a bidder, and, and even if not, the lender is going to take it back. So the mm-hmm. lender uh, in that will put that first bid in there, mm-hmm. and sometimes it can be pretty high. And if nobody gets it, then it goes right back to the to the lender. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and then there's a deed executed called the deed under power. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the security deed, it, it's in there uh, that says that the, the lender does have the right to sell mm-hmm. um, and for sale and to act as the power of attorney uh, to sign on behalf of the owner uh, mm-hmm. or prior owner in this case. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That is that is really good stuff. So you'll see this thing, this document called a waiver of borrower's rights. Yeah. Now, now, does the borrower have a choice to sign that document or not? Uh, well, they do have a choice, mm-hmm. um, but if they don't sign it, they're not getting the loan. So okay. then they have to buy it in cash. Uh, but okay. so if if they want that loan, every lender in Georgia is going to require they sign that document. Uh, it 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 is scary in the sense mm-hmm. that you are waiving your fifth and fourteenth yeah, amendment who, who right to, to due process. Their rights? Yes. I'm like, stand on my rights. Right, uh-huh. right. Well, I mean, if it, this this is the requirement set put upon buyers who want to get loans, mm-hmm. uh, and the lenders, it, this is legal. <laughs> you can mm-hmm. the lenders can require this, and so this is the notice to that buyer that at that closing, uh, that in 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 response in, in to get this loan, the buyer cannot require uh, that the lender has to take them before a judge if, if they're going to sue them, if they're going to foreclose on them. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically make your payments, pay your taxes, uh, you know, keep the property up, uh, you know, updated, insured, uh, mm-hmm. and you'll be fine. But that security deed, that does give the lender the right to do this and they don't have to take it before a judge. Excellent. So, so, um, so you can waive your rights to, uh, to, um, to due process, to due process. <laughs> to it's, go it, before it, yeah. yeah. It's, it sounds, it sounds rough, but I guess it's what you have to do to get a loan these days. Yeah. Um, so you have a right to cancel that loan too. Um, is, is there a period of time? I mean, after you sign the paperwork, what if you have like, right. what if you have this buyer's remorse and you're just like, <laughs> you know what? I just signed up for an arm and they're killing people with arms. Yeah. I mean, do you have anything, is there anything you can do at that so, point? So, yes. It, well, in a refinance transaction only, mm-hmm. uh, number one, and only if it's your primary residence mm-hmm. um, and only if it's with a new lender, not mm-hmm. a current lender that, mm-hmm. that you have on the property. Uh, so can you get what's called a, a rescission period or right to cancel as you brought mm-hmm. up? Uh, and that is a three-day window uh, mm-hmm. that the government's basically saying you could change your mind at mm-hmm. no cost to you. 
Uh, and in every refinance transaction where it's the primary residence, uh, they uh, they will give you a notice of right to cancel that you can fill out if you're the if you're the borrower and you decide you know what uh, I changed my mind or the rate mm. the rates went down. You know, mm-hmm. and, um, yeah. you know as a closing attorney, I hate that because you you know I did all this work, but uh-huh. that's just that's the rights uh, given to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last part there, most people don't don't know is that uh, that it's only for a lender that's not your current lender. Mm-hmm. Now that's that it's required, mm-hmm. but most lenders at a courtesy will provide that notice of right to cancel anyways. Mm-hmm. That right can be waived. Let's say you're a, a borrower and you want to go ahead and, and waive that. And you just you say you, you're cashing out and you really want that money. Um, but you'll have to typically do that in writing um, it, it, to, to the lender and the lender has to approve of that. But uh, yeah, so you are given that three day uh, rescission period, three day window to cancel. OK, so you do have at least three days yeah. there in a re, in a refi. Right. And the Saturday and Saturdays do count. And Saturdays yeah, do count. not Sundays, but Saturdays. Well, that's really good to know. <laughs> okay, so you said primary and secondary residences. Is yep. there a way a person can have two primary residences? Say, you know, okay, so I I know some people. They're not me, but they but you know they 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 have their their winter home here mm-hmm. in Atlanta, and they have their <laughs> summer home in, in Martha's Vineyard uh-huh. or Cape Cod or wherever wherever rich people really rich people have their <laughs> second home. Is there such a thing as two primary residences? Mm. Excuse me. No, uh, I mean, you're only able to claim residence in one place. And okay. you may see this, you know, say for Florida residents, because mm-hmm. Florida doesn't have state income tax. So mm-hmm. you'll get people claiming, oh, my Florida home is my is my, is primary, my primary residence. Home. But, you know, this is the stuff that uh, that these tax commissioners are, are, are hired to do is look mm-hmm. at that and say, well, wait a minute. If you're claiming Florida as your primary state, mm-hmm. but yet you're spending, you know, 250 days in Georgia, mm-hmm. eh, I don't think that qualifies. And mm-hmm. that's what these uh, tax commissioners in the states can do. And they do do this is to, to make sure you're not trying to game the system and avoid uh, taxation, mm-hmm. uh, hefty taxation. So it, wherever you're living, you have a driver's license in the state, you spend more than a, you know 185 days in the state, uh, that's typically going to be the state of your residence, and that house that you have there, uh, that's going to be the one that's your primary. Okay, and so this other one would be your secondary residence, Correct. like a vacation home? Mm-hmm. Or investment property, you know, depending, mm-hmm. yeah, but that would typically be the case. Okay. So, um, so are there any, any breaks for people with a secondary home or investment property? Uh, like from a tax purpose, I'm not a tax, uh, a professional, mm-hmm. so I don't want to say, speak, uh, okay. in an area that I'm not, yeah. not yeah. too familiar with in that capacity. But, um, I would say that you typically, I mean, people typically will use the house. That's their biggest home, the home that they can maximize, uh, those uh, exemptions we talked about, homestead mm-hmm. uh, or uh, or other exemptions, that's typically the one they're going to want to look at. Yeah. Or a favorable state that has uh, that that gives you an income tax break. Okay, excellent. And so the last topic that I really want to get into is how do people? Uh, okay, so this is actually a hot topic of real estate litigation because <laughs> this comes in this comes in my door more than anything else. It's people who hold property as uh, as joint tenants with the right of survivorship mm-hmm. versus people who hold property as a tenancy in common. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I think uh, a while ago in Georgia, a long time ago, before 1971, you could hold a property as a joint tenant in its entirety. I don't know if I got <laughs> the language right, but I don't think that exists anymore. But OK, so joint tenants with the right of survivorship versus right. tenancy in common. Can you get a little bit into what those two things are and the differences? Sure. Uh, so the, uh, say, joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, mm-hmm. you typically see that when uh, the two people, two or more people hold title mm-hmm. to a property and they're related, typically mm-hmm. a husband and wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that means is that each party, each person uh, owns the complete, the, mm-hmm. the whole. Mm-hmm. So should one pass away, property is automatically vested in the surviving spouse. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, I would say, probably the most common we see these days, simply because that's, you know, people don't want to have to deal with uh, uh, with probate uh, and having their estate uh, administered. So that, that's typically what you see. Uh, tenants in common is where you get a situation where, you know, perhaps you have two uh, two people. Let's take an example, a husband and wife, but they, they have separate kids, mm-hmm. second or third marriage. They're like, you know, I, I want to have 50 percent and you can have 50 percent. So that way, if I pass away, I want my kids to get an interest in the property. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a, a vehicle and that's the way you'd want to do that. You know, you'd have the tenancy in common um, to, to capture that. 
Okay. You know what? I really want to get into that a little bit more because uh, there's a lot of real estate litigation that yeah. actually happens, and the rights are different between the two. There's there's some things that you can do in a tenancy in common that yeah. you can't do with a joint tenancy with right of survivorship. But anyways, we are at the end of this show. This has been a great show, Joel. Thanks for coming on. Uh, can you yeah. give our listeners some contact information for you once again? Definitely. My name is Joel Vanderveer. My law firm is Vanderveer and Page. Uh, please visit my website, www.vpattorneysatlaw.com. And you can give us a call at area code 470-509-3883. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. This has been another awesome show. I want to I want to thank the guys that are making this show actually happen. The men behind uh, the magic, I'll call it, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, Mr. Sam Davis over there, our superstar producer, and Mr. Jonathan Bryant, who made the videos all come together during this show. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thanks. See you guys next week.